Hello, everybody. My name is Annie Stevens. I am one of the forensic nurse coordinators here at Ohio Health in Central Ohio. I'm bringing to you a presentation about the care and transport of the forensic patient. So objectives for this class are here. Um, you'll know what is a forensic nurse, um, how forensic nurses become involved with the victims of sorry victims of intentional violence. Discuss we'll discuss the abuse cycle. What sexual assault, domestic violence, and human trafficking? What is it? Um, how first responders can help and harm our victims? Um, define medical hearsay in some court, different court objectives. Um, what is evidence and how to preserve that? And the other um, objectives are here. You can read through those. So, what is a forensic patient? Um, Forensic patients are um, typically survivors of intentional violence or, you know, some people don't survive the incident, but in our eyes as forensic nurses here in the state of Ohio, um, our patients are alive um, and have to consent to our exam. Other states, you know, forensic nurses can be called in when there is a deceased patient from a victim from a um, violent offense. Um, but here in Ohio, our patients um, have to consent. So they can be survivors of rape, human trafficking, domestic violence. Those are the three big ones that we see, but also shootings, um, stabbings, trauma, drugs, um, and other different um, forms of intentional violence. So what is a forensic nurse? We are nurses um, who specialize in trauma-informed care for patients who are victims um, and or perpetrators of trauma, both intentional and unintentional. We do see um, perpetrators also up in Delaware County. In Franklin County, we typically do not, um, but Delaware and Marion counties and Mansfield, we um, will see perpetrators also to try to collect evidence from them. We are somewhat of an intersection between um, healthcare and the law. We're a, we um, try to inform our survivors of their options with the legal system when we're caring for them, how to um, get assistance after their visit, because as we know, the, the trauma that occurred doesn't stop just because they are seen in the ED. There's a lot of other things that go along with it and a lot of help that they need once they leave. Um, and then first and foremost, though, we are nurses. We're unbiased. We believe our patients when they tell us what happened and we treat what they tell us happened to them. Um, our areas especially include um, trauma informed patient centered care of survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, abuse, neglect, strangulation, and human trafficking. The roles of forensic nurses. So what we do do is we establish rapport with our survivors. So trust is huge when a patient or somebody has been through a traumatic event. They need to be able to trust us to disclose for one and then also so that we can help them, um, you know, establish goals after their visit and safety plan um, for when they're discharged. Um, we obtain history, photographs of injuries. We collect swabs for potential DNA, which, which we turn over to law enforcement. We don't keep any evidence in our hospitals. We turn all of it over to law enforcement in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred. Um, we communicate a lot with law enforcement, physicians, and advocates. Um, we do turn the evidence over, as I said, for potential prosecution. We do a lot of education. Education is probably 90% of my job, um, educating nurses um, and other frontline hospital staff on when to call us, how we can help survivors and um, other resources that our team provides. We're active in the um, SART or the sexual assault response team in both Franklin, Delaware, and then a Marion and Mansfield were very active on these teams and these teams consist of law enforcement prosecutors. Um, juvenile services and um, the jails to best work out plans and protocols for um, one our treatment of survivors, but two 
how to better inform survivors of how of outcomes of cases and um, the um, status of the perpetrator too. We do provide expert testimony, so we testify in court at times. Um, and then again, we complete suspect exams in some cases. One, the things that we don't do, we do not investigate crime. So we do collect evidence, we collect photographs, you know, but law enforcement and the prosecutor's office are the ones who investigate crime and we don't determine truth or guilt. So as patients with chest pain come in, we believe our patients, you know, we believe that you have pain um, when you tell us you have pain, just like when somebody tells us that they're a victim of crime, we believe that also. And we document and we treat them according to what their complaint is. So what is trauma-informed patient-centered care? So what do these terms mean? These are so important, especially, you know, with EMS, you're the first people typically that a patient may run into um, in the field. And one of the big things with trauma-informed care is understanding that trauma in our past trauma affects how we um, react to trauma that's occurring right now. So one example that I have is, um, say you go on a call with a patient and their chief complaint is they have a large abscess on their arm, okay? You know, it's obvious that they may be addicted to drugs and they're crying, yelling, you know, and they seem pretty angry. Um, so what is guiding that reaction? And to be trauma-informed, you understand that the, the events in that person's life, you know, whether it was abuse or whether maybe they had a friend that had you may, an abscess and maybe had to get their arm amputated or had a, a long healthcare issue from it, you understand that that is playing into some of the emotions that they have. Not that you don't wanna let your guard down, you obviously wanna be safe, but you understand that they react because of trauma that they care, carry with them. So they're fearful, you know, maybe they have a history of not being treated well by healthcare providers, unfortunately, because of the way, you know, they act or because of their history of drug abuse. So maybe they don't trust you. But um, as a trauma informed provider, you understand that and you go into the interaction with that patient with that understanding. Um, a lot of times they, they, um, the drug abuse also, um, their coping mechanisms may not be the same as what they were before they were using, um, and you also understand that. So patient-centered, what is patient-centered care? Patient-centered care means that you understand and you see that patient as a whole, not just the incident right now, not just the abscess or whatever they're calling you for right at this time, but that patient as a whole, that they have needs, they need to feel safe, they have basic needs just like all of us, you know, to feel safe and understood um, and that you're going to help them, right, and not judge them. So that's trauma-informed patient-centered care kind of in a nutshell, all summed up. Um, what if they decline your help? A lot of times survivors will decline your help and that's okay because we want to empower them to get the help that they need in the situation that they're in you know, and empower them to make those decisions of what they need at that time. So if a patient declines your help at that time, to be trauma-informed and patient-centered, we wanna make sure that they feel safe calling you back is one example. So, you know, should you change your mind, please call us back or go to the emergency room. That would be very trauma-informed, patient-centered. Also, you can allow them to know your concerns. I'm very concerned about your arm. I really want you to get treated, but if you don't want to at that at this time, that's okay. Um, and then letting them know again, you know, that they're safe if they want to call you back um, or go to the emergency room to be treated. So why do we bring this up? So understanding their own trauma is so important when we when we're treating survivors of interpersonal violence. We all carry trauma from our past, okay? So this picture on the left, of course, is what it looks like your first day arriving for your fire service job. You have a big fire waiting on you. 
and um, you're going to put that out. But there's a lot of people experiencing trauma on the scene. So, you know, you experience trauma, you take a little bit of that big fire with you because you know that somebody's home may have been destroyed or business. Um, but also the people on the scene are carrying trauma with them. So before you go on this big fire, you need to unpack your bags in your locker. And on the right here is kind of an example of the bags that we carry with us everywhere we go, um, including um, first responders. So we carry our past with us. We carry the expectations of what people think we should be, you know, guilt, shame, you know, all those things we carry with us and we tuck them safely away in a place in our brain, but sometimes they show up. And this is so important in self care. You know, um, there may be a run that triggers you or, um, you know, somebody's response to something may trigger some past events from your life. Um, so we need to be aware of our own personal trauma before we can care for others with trauma. There is a great video called um, The Neurobiology of Trauma. It's a video by Rebecca, Rebecca Campbell. She is a neurobiologist or a neuroscientist and does a lot of um, informational sessions on the brain and the response to trauma. So. Um, of course, as medics um, and firefighters, we're always waiting on that big, you know, physical trauma or good traumas, you know, that we talk about. But there's also trauma inside every run um, that we go on and we carry a little bit of that with us. So it's very important to be aware of that. And that video really helps you kind of understand it. Here's some basics from it. The neurobiology, some basics from the neurobiology of trauma. So when trauma or a traumatic event occurs, your, your body releases stress hormones, right? So sometimes we, we feel that um, even, even us, you know, in the field, going on a case or going on a run, waiting for a patient to arrive, um, all of those things. But also, you know, the, the patient is feeling this. Sometimes the person who's calling you is feeling all of these reactions. Um, but most of all, we want to focus on the survivor right now at this time. So um, they can last up to uh, three or four days sometimes after the event. So um, we know about adrenaline, so that fight or flight. We talk a lot about this in medic school. You know, everybody has their fight or their flight. You know, are we going to stay and play or load and go? All those types of things we talk about and adrenaline causes that. But cortisol also is released into the body, the hormone cortisol. And what it does is it stops pain so we can escape. But it also can cause a complete shutdown in the body, causing a freeze reaction. This is the more common reaction over fight and flight. So. Um, we don't talk about it enough because freezing is completely normal in a traumatic situation. So say um, you are going on a run, it's a really bad run, maybe a trauma, and there's a lot of, you know, kind of survivor victims on the scene, maybe survivors and people who maybe haven't survived. And Cortisol is also being released in the first responders. So sometimes there are moments where we freeze, you know, so that's why we train the way we train. We do mega code after mega code, right? We do scenario after scenario for training on water pressure and, you know, hose capacity and all that kind of stuff and EMS and fire so that when we get on the scene, hopefully we're not going to freeze and not know what to do but it is very normal. So survivors of violence also feel this. So um, a lot of times with our sexual assault survivors, one of the things that they tell us is, I just laid there. I felt like I was just laying there. I couldn't move. I felt like I was watching them rape me. And this is complete, it's very heartbreaking to think of a person, you know, they're being raped and they can't move. But we want our survivors to know that's normal. You did nothing wrong, okay? So other things and other hormones that are released are opiates, so that helps with pain. Um, sometimes, you know, a result of opiates gives you that very flat, uh, disconnected affect. So when you, 
when you see a survivor, you know, maybe they just survived a horrible sexual assault, you know, they possibly could be very flat or disconnected. You know, they could be crying or, you know, they may be laughing. And why is that? Because oxytocin also is released during stress and trauma. So it is very normal for this huge range of emotions for survivors, you know, and we want to be patient centered and um, trauma informed and allow those survivors to know all of this is completely normal. Um, the way you're feeling is normal. What your experience is experiencing now, you know, from the trauma is normal and that we're sorry that that trauma happened to them. Um, so it affects every part of our being, our, our physical, mental, and behavioral, and our social. So stress can lead to violence. So this right now is so important, especially with domestic violence and um, COVID, um, where people are out of work, you know, they're locked in their homes with um, sometimes perpetrators who um, are at increased stress because of decreased income or, you know, the kids are around all day. They're not going to school like they normally do. So there's a lot of stressors in people's lives right now. So um, we expect to see an increase in domestic violence during this time. And we have seen that. And we, we also expect to see an increase in the severity of that violence. And we have seen that too. So the domestic violence incidents are still occurring you know, a little bit higher rate, but also the violence is getting worse. So sexual violence. So this is part of the Ohio Revised Code 2907. Everything kind of has a little statute with it um, in the chapter. So what defines sexual violence? So it's sexual contact or behavior that occurs without consent. So this is a very basic, you know, um, definition of sexual violence. If you read the law, it's very complicated and long, but without consent is the biggest thing. Um, so there are several terms that, that um, you know, you may hear throughout the legal system to describe sexual, this sexual contact, such as rape, sexual battery, sexual misconduct, molestation, incest, intimate partner violence, drug facilitated sexual assault. So those are all terms that, you know, prosecutors later figure out um, when they are assigning a crime, you know, they're assigning the severity of a crime to it and they're trying to press charges. But to us, you know, it's sexual abuse or sexual assault is fine. When we see these patients, we want to make sure that everything we chart is in quotes um, from what the patient says, if possible, um, because these are, have high incidence of being um, used in legal proceedings. The law loves EMS because you guys are first on the scene. You sometimes can see the interaction between, you know, a survivor and the perpetrator, or, you know, the survivor may have these spontaneous utterances where they tell you things. Um, you know, that later, once they're away from the situation and they're in the hospital, they may not say them again. Um, so some common myths about sexual assault. So she doesn't act like she was raped. Um, and again, I go back to the rape trauma syndrome that we just talked about. You guys know now that what, however your patient is acting is very normal um, because of all of the hormones that are released during stress, right? Many, many sexual assaults don't report right away. Typically, we see our patients at that 48 to 72 hour mark after their crime has occurred. Um, so it's very normal. You know, you will get a range of emotions in these patients. People falsely accuse others of rape a lot. So um, there have been studies on this. And typically, the research shows about 2 to 8% is all that people falsely accuse others of and you and within that category a lot of times is not false reporting it's recanted reporting because of pressure from the judicial system it is a very grueling judicial system where we put our survivors on trial you know or 
you know, outside pressure from the family saying, well, you know, if it's say another family member, you know, he's a good person, you need to drop these charges. Um, and so those numbers are within that too. So it is very rare that somebody falsely accuses somebody else of raping them. If they didn't want it to happen, why didn't they fall back, fight back? Again, you know why now, because we talked about fight, flight, freeze. Um, Research shows about 50% of rape victims um, experience this freeze um, reaction or tonic immobility is what is like a is a lingo term that we use too, where you freeze, you're not able to fight back. And some even say, you know, that they feel like they, they saw the assault happening as if they were outside of their body. Um, most rapes are strangers, so four to five sexual four out of five sexual assaults, and I really believe that this number is much higher. Probably four point nine is what I think out of five sexual assaults are committed by somebody the person knows. Most of the time, people know their perpetrator somehow. Um, it's not the not the crime where you know people jump out of the bushes and grab you. You know, um, most of the time, it's not like that. They had sex with each, with each other before, so it can't be rape. So no, um, each time that there's a sexual intercourse or a sexual contact, there needs to be consent. Um, this one, you know, it does get pretty touchy sometimes in court, very difficult to prove um, because sexual assault, typically, you know, the only people there are the perpetrator and the survivor. So it is it is a difficult crime to prove in court. Um, there, no, there are no injuries, so there must not have been a rape. So the vaginal and rectal area are very vascular. The tissue there is very elastic, much like the tissue inside of your mouth. Um, so you think about your mouth, you may bite your lip or you can you know, push on it with your tongue and it stretches, right? And it recoils back to where it was. If you bite your, the inside of your lip or your jaw in the morning, typically that area is healed by the evening, right? Or the next morning because it's very vascular and the type of tissue that it is, it, it heals really rapidly. And this is very similar to the tissue in the gen genitals. Um, so what is a drug facilitated sexual assault? So um, a drug facilitated sexual assault is where a perpetrator will use alcohol or other drugs to facilitate their assault on another person, just like it says. So sometimes you may see memory gaps um, with your survivors, or uh, maybe they'll report to you, you know, like I had one drink. You know, usually I can have I can have a couple drinks and I'm fine. Um, some it may be from the perpetrator adding extra shots to a drink or extra alcohol to a drink or putting you know a pill inside the drink um, that the patient didn't know was there. They may have large gaps of time that are unaccounted for or waking up and not knowing how they got somewhere. Um, so that would be a red flag to a drug facilitated sexual assault. Drugs are very interesting when it's added to, to alcohol too or to a drink um, because um, as you can see in the picture there up in the left, the substance that's put in the drink typically floats on top. So whether it's a liquid or a um, crushed up pill or something, it will flow on the surface of the drink. And so when the patient swallows or takes a sip of the drink, all of the pill will go into their mouth since it's floating on top. So they get a huge uh, bolus of that medication or you know um, substance that's put in there. So it may not take much, you know, they may just drink a little bit of their soda or a little bit of their drink, you know, and then they start feeling kind of um, out of it or weird. So as as an EMS provider, a patient just told you they were raped, so now what? Um, medical needs always supersede forensic needs. So just like we're forensic nurses, we're always nurses first. Just And so your patient that you see in EMS, um, medical needs are always first. So can you take a blood pressure? Yes, you can. Can you do their, you know, their other vital signs? What if you have to take their temperature under their tongue? It's fine. Um, we do ask that you kind of keep the, the covering to the thermometer if the crime just occurred. But like I said, 
typically these crimes don't um, report. These survivors don't always report right away. So um, at 48 to 72 hours, typically there's no more evidence that would be found in their mouth anyway. Um, but if you'd like to, it would be great if you kept the covering to the thermometer. Most places has the, they have the temporal thermometer now, so um, you're safe there. What about their clothing? So we just asked, you know, if there's holes or dirt on their clothing and you have to take it off, try not to cut through those areas if possible. But if you have to, because your patient is crashing or, you know, not doing well, you know, you have to. So please just take their clothing in with them um, into the hospital. Usually it ends up underneath them anyway, and um, we can collect it in the hospital when we roll them. So how to talk to a survivor of sexual assault on the way to the hospital. So listen, you know, that's the biggest thing. Sometimes um, they, they just want to talk, but most of the time they're gonna be very quiet. Um, and in this incidence, I say, in really any incidents where somebody's sick or, you know, not feeling good, that silence is okay. Because as we learned about that trauma on the brain, um, Rebecca Campbell um, kind of relates it to writing a conversation on post-it notes. So each, each word is written on a different post-it note. So if you take this presentation that I'm trying, you know, I'm teaching you and you take every word that I say and you write it on a different post-it note. When trauma occurs, basically those post-it notes or those memories are kind of thrown up in the air. And um, survivors in those moments and hours and days after that event are trying to put those post-it notes in order, trying to figure out, you know, what happened in order because you know, their brain has been disrupted by all these hormones and the events that have happened. So that's where silence can really help them. You know, if they want to talk, allow them to talk, but if not, it's okay to be silent. We don't want to put any of our old trauma on them. Um, it's okay to express concern. Um, and a lot of it is not, not concern trying to force them to go to the hospital, but I'm sorry that this happened to you. You're really brave for coming forward. Um, and then validating feelings, you know, I'm sure that was very scary is a great way to validate their feelings without putting guilt or shame on them. So treat them medically like we talked about. And then again, silence is okay. The things that we don't wanna do is make it about you. Like if you were my child, I would have, you don't really know how you would react if they were your child. Um, a lot of times we think we know how we would react, but we really don't. And that puts a lot of, a lot of, a lot of pressure on them because possibly they don't have a supportive family member like you, you know, or something like that. And that really can add trauma to their already, their already bad situation. So you don't need to ask for details that are not needed for their train, their treatment. So if they call and, you know, you can ask, do you have pain anywhere? And say they have pain in their leg, you know, they may say, my leg really hurts from where I was kicked. Okay, you can chart that, but you don't need to get into any more detail about that. The forensic nurse will come in and we get very detailed um, about how trauma occurs and the events leading up to it and after the event. So um, you can defer all of that to us, to the forensic nurse, so that's fine. But um, we don't want you guys to feel like you need to ask details of the trauma or details of the assault, we prefer that you wait because we don't want them telling their story over and over. So preparing their survivor for what's going to happen when they come into the ED. So what to expect? They're going to be evaluated by a physician. Um, they're going to be medically cleared. And then a forensic nurse may be called in if that's what the patient chooses. So we don't get called in on every single sexual assault. We prefer that we do, but sometimes survivors do choose not to have a forensic nurse come in. They may just want treated for STDs or you know checked out for something else, and that's fine. Usually they consult with us. Um, the ED staff will consult with us um, if the patient doesn't need a nurse at that time. 
you know, and we, we give them resources to pass on to that survivor. Um, but we may not come in if, if that's not what the patient wants. Um, law enforcement will be called sexual assault is a felony crime, which we are mandated reporters of felonious crime. So law enforcement, you know, they may be called while the patient's there. Um, patients can report anonymously. So law enforcement doesn't necessarily need to come while the patient's there, um, but you know, they may, especially if there's bystanders, By, you know, nothing really is anonymous now in these days because of cell phones and camera security cameras and stuff like that. So, you know, bystanders sometimes report crime, but as the hospital will not report the crime if the survivor of sexual assault asks us not to using their name, we will report it anonymously. So the other thing that will happen when the patient is in the ED is we will do safety and discharge planning. You know, even if the patient is admitted as, as nursing works and healthcare works, you know, we're always planning for that discharge and, you know, their safety. Um, so one thing to note at this point is a forensic nurse cannot tell a patient if they were raped. You know, um, injuries sometimes happen in, in the genitals, you know, without sexual assault. Um, what we can do is we do our full exam, we document the injuries, and we collect potential um, DNA swabs. So we collect the swabs, you know, thinking that that's an area that may have DNA in it. But um, if you're patient, you know, we don't want you saying to the patient, let's go to the hospital and they have a special nurse there that can tell you if you're raped. We cannot do that. So transport to the hospital, clothing is evidence. The patient's body is evidence in sexual assault. So we want you to treat those complaints as we talked about before and document what they tell you in quotes. Sometimes, you know, patients will make these weird um, statements. We call them spontaneous utterances. So it may be silent as we talked about, you know, and maybe the survivor says, I can't believe he did that to me. He would never do that to me. Those are things that are very good for you to write down in the report with quotes. You can respond to that by, would you like to talk about that? Um, you know, if they do, you can talk about it. You don't have to say, hold on, let me write this down. Um, but it's good to have that documentation in the report, you know, if they have those utterances, um, but you don't need to write word for word everything that they tell you. Um, it's best practice though to wait and have them tell the events to the hospital staff or the forensic nurse, the events about the assault. So domestic violence is the willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, or other abuse is part of a systemic power uh, pattern of power and control. Um, a lot of perpetrators will intimidate their partner, and it includes physical, sexual, verbal, psychological, and emotional emotional violence and abuse. So typically when you're running on a survivor of domestic violence, the complaint could be could be stress or like a chronic illness or fatigue, um, you know, things like that. You may be called, you know, during the incident if the patient um, or a bystander or family member calls. Um, but a lot of times these survivors show up in our EDs and they're complaining of more, you know, common complaints from the pattern of abuse, not from the actual abuse itself all the time. Um, a lot of times, you know, things just may not make sense. And, you know, they say they ran into the wall and bruised their arm, but they also have bruising on the other side of their body. So that doesn't make sense, you know, um, and that could be over a domestic violence incident. So as we know, violence, including domestic violence, will escalate over time without intervention. Um, that's a proven fact, um, and we know that. Um, mandated reporting, so you guys are mandated reporters as the ED is. Um, so wounds needing repair will be reported, fractures, burns, penetrating trauma, Temporary incapacitation. So temporary incapacitation means um, the patient couldn't think for themselves or do for themselves for whatever amount of time. So that's where strangulation comes in. 
Um, a lot of survivors see strangulation as a very normal part of their fights, you know, with their partner that, you know, they always keep, you know, we ask our survivors, did they put pressure on your neck? You know, and they may say back to us, yeah, they always do that. And it's sometimes it really becomes normalized in these domestic violence situations, but it's not normal and it can cause long term health effects that we want you to be aware of. Um, so it's very lethal. The odds of becoming a homicide victim increased by 750% for the victim. Once pressure is put on their neck, so typically. People who are strangled are not killed by strangulation, though. They're killed by weapons. So when you hear laws coming around trying to get weapons out of the hands of perpetrators, this is one of the reasons. A lot of times, people who are killed in homicide by their domestic partners have been strangled. Um, it's only about 6.8 seconds to unconsciousness with pressure on your neck and one to two and two minutes to death. So. Most of the time, too, with the way that the neck is, um, the anatomy of the neck, um, there are no external injuries. There are times where you may see abrasions and scratches on the neck. A lot of times that comes from the survivor trying to get, trying to pull the perpetrator's hands off their neck. But most of the time in strangulation, there are no external injuries from the perpetrator. Incontinence of urine lasts about, happens at about 15 seconds. And incontinence of stool happens at 30 seconds. So what does this information tell us? So if your patient, you know, says they don't remember being unconscious, you can ask them, like, are these the clothes that you were wearing during the incident? And if they say no, ask them why. And if they say that they peed themselves because they were fighting, what does this tell you? So you become unconscious around 6.8 seconds with a strangulation. And at 15 seconds, your urinary sphincter will um, loosen and you'll um, urinate on yourself. So this tells us that our patient was strangled past unconsciousness. They continue to put pressure on the patient's neck after they were unconscious. So it's very important that we find out where their clothing is. You guys don't have to per se, but if it comes up, you know, it's important. Um, if the patient tells you that they changed their clothes, you can ask them to bring them to the hospital with you and we can collect those as evidence. Um, if not, it's fine because medical care really is, is why you're there. Um, the law enforcement can go out and get stuff later too. Um, most of the time patients will report that they choke. So as a healthcare provider, we don't use the word choke unless there's an obstruction internally of the airway, that's choking. Strangulation is an external force pushed on the neck. So when you're documenting word for word what the patient says, it's okay to say that they choked me um, in quotes, but when you're summing up your report, you would say as a healthcare provider that the patient was strangled. Because again, strangulation is an external force, choking is an internal blockage of the airway. So um, here are some information about how much pressure it takes to occlude these uh, vessels in the neck. So the jugular vein only takes about less than four pounds of pressure to occlude. Um, the carotid artery only takes 11 pounds and the trachea 30 pounds. 30 pounds. So an adult handshake, just a typical adult handshake, um, is about 80 to 100 pounds of pressure. So this tells you if you have rage involved and adrenaline involved, the pressure that's put on somebody's neck when they're strangled can be tremendous and it can cause a lot of um, damage. So we may not see it right away. It can cause, you know, um, nicks to the intima in the vessels or, um, um, you know, little hemorrhages that happen that we see later or hemorrhages in the brain. As soon as oxygen is cut off to the brain, um, damage starts occurring. So some of the things that you may see um, in the field, you know, sometimes they may be uh, bradycardic if the um, if it just happened from stimulations of stimulation of the um, 
transmitters in the next neck, but these are the things that we're really looking for. So um, have you eaten since this happened? And they may say no, and then we'll ask why. And a lot of times they'll tell us, they'll report to us that it hurts to swallow. So those are the types of things that you guys may see, or they may report voice changes or, you know, pain, even though we may not see that external injury. Um, 50% of victims report that voice change or, you know, they feel kind of um, hoarse or that loss of appetite or pain. Um, so a lot of this is just breaking down the things that you may see, difficulty breathing. Of course, you're going to treat them medically um, the way that you would. Any sort of patient, though, that has a lot of pressure put on their neck, we want to consider putting a C collar on them. Um, because um, of the damage that can happen, especially if a forearm was used um, from behind, that's a tremendous amount of pressure. They, they should be considered a cervical spine injury until ruled otherwise and consider taking them to a trauma hospital if possible. The test that we want on these survivors is a CTA of the neck. We need the contrast in that CT to be able to see um, little tiny damage to the inner vessels of the neck that can occur with this, this pressure or um, trauma to the neck. Um, so we need to get that CTA of the neck, but with, with a large amount of pressure to the neck, again, you wanna consider you know, cervical spine precautions and um, possibly transporting to a trauma hospital if they're reporting you know, major side effects from the incident. This slide I like, I'm gonna go back to it. Abusers strangle their pain. They don't strangle them to kill them. They strangle them to let their victims know that they can kill them at any time if they choose to. So this is a very powerful weapon in domestic violence and it's used more often than you would think. Um, we're working on um, laws to help provide, to provide protection to survivors of strangulation. Um, at this time, Ohio is one of two states that don't have a standalone um, strangulation um, law in its books. So a lot of stranglers are getting off. Um, and, you know, that's not good because we know that, that, that violence escalates over time. And these abusers typically kill their victims with means other than strangulation. That weapons is what they really go after to try to kill them. So when you're with the patient, questions that you can ask them that are non-leading, we wanna be very non-leading, um, is tell me about your voice. Have you eaten or drank anything? If not, why? And you know, like I said before, we expect them to say, cause it hurts. Um, if they don't, that's fine too. Um, did you pass out or feel lightheaded? A lot of times survivors of strangulation don't remember passing out. So this is not, the end of the questioning here. Um, do you remember anything or do you remember waking up somewhere and you don't know how you got there? So this is a better way to ask if the patient passed out because of the anoxia that comes from strangulation. So hypoxia is a decrease of um, oxygen over time, right? The patient struggles. And, you know, if you care for patients who are hypoxic, a lot of times they have memory issues too during the event. So anoxia is the instant cutoff of oxygen to the brain. It's instantly cut off from the pressure that's put on the neck and, you know, patients can pass out and they don't even know that they did. They wake up and sometimes they're on the floor or, you know, the, the perpetrators move them somehow because they passed out. Um, I have a video of a, pa a person fighting in a parking lot with her boyfriend, they're arguing and he strangles her, she passes out on the ground, and then some guy comes out of the restaurant and walks by them, and the boyfriend, you know, pulls the patient's arm, and she stands up and starts walking away with him. She has no idea what has just happened to her, but it was caught on a still um, camera, and that shows you, you know, the anoxia happens, they pass out, but they wake up just as fast. There is something called an anoxic seizure, and it's a seizure that happens after strangulation or that sudden cutoff of oxygen to the brain. 
So the patient could be strangled, they wake up, and then they go into a seizure. A lot of times they don't remember any of this period, and these seizures don't have a postictal period. So if you see somebody, you know, and it's possible that they were in a domestic violence situation, um, maybe a bystander calls because they see somebody seizing, it is possible that they did have a seizure and they don't have a postictal period. So these anoxic seizures, again, don't have a postictal period. Um, we can ask them if you urinated or defecated on themselves during the incident, where the clothing are, like we talked about before. Um, what to assess for? Okay, so typically their assessments are normal. So we want to assess for shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, bradycardia, hypotension because of those baroreceptor stimulation, like I said, and the, vag the vagal stimulation from the pressure, um, difficulty moving their neck, um, memory loss, continued pain in the neck, and that seizure activity, stroke-like symptoms, or petechial rash. Sometimes it'll just look like a red, like their skin may be red or rosacea, um, which is difficult to notice now that everybody is wearing masks. A lot of us have a lot of redness on our face. So trauma hospital. So if you have two or more of these symptoms, it's very good to think about going to a trauma hospital. Studies show that 50% of men who kill police officers have a history of strangling women. So what does this tell you when you arrive on your scene? These are very dangerous scenes because these perpetrators will kill you too. Um, the officers that were killed in Westerville, um, Stephen Smith from Columbus and the Kirkersville officer, all of those officers were killed by somebody that have a history of strangulation. I truly believe that the rate is higher than 50%. Um, there is a, um, there is a program that's studying this. It's called the Strangulation Prevention Institute. It's out in California. You can look up their website and they have amazing information on this, but they look into every police and um, shooting or death um, during line of duty death. And they study the criminal history of these perpetrators and they're finding that an alarming rate of them have a history of strangling and domestic violence in their, his, in their past. So how can you help the survivor? Let them make decisions. We really want to empower all of our survivors that we see of violence. Um, talk to the person in private. So maybe take them to your to the truck or take the, the perpetrator to the truck and talk to them out there. A lot of times um, perpetrators will use intimidation. They will find that they'll make sure that that victim is in their line of sight so that they don't tell you anything. So we really want to make sure that they have an opportunity to um, tell you what happened if that if they feel comfortable. Be empathetic and respectful. Express their concern, your concern for their safety, and only do it one time. Um, we don't want to put increased guilt on them. You know, I'm really concerned about your safety right now. I really want, I would really like to help you um, if you feel like you want help right now. And that's a good way to express those concerns without putting increased guilt on your patient. Let them know it's not their fault. Whatever they did, they don't deserve to be beat or strangled. Help is available when they're ready. They can come to the ED or call 911. 911 typically is their, you know, the go-to number that we need to give them to remind them that, you know, they can call as soon as you leave, call you back um, if that's when they want to go and get evaluated or get help. Um, and then there's domestic violence hotlines that they can call and shelter. So um, Turning Point is up here in um, Delaware County and Choices is in Franklin County. They don't have to live at the shelter to get services from the shelter. There's a lot of legal aid that helps out at that shelter to help them with legal issues and also programming for them and their children to help with the trauma that they're, they're, they're living in. Safety plan with them, you know, if, if, if we leave, we want you to call back and um, you can always call us for guidance. Um, even when law enforcement takes photos on the scene, we still take our own photos. 
One thing I want you to know with these domestic violence survivors is that coming to the hospital is not a magical end all for these incidents. Sometimes it can cause more stress and we want the survivor to make the decision to come. We don't want to, you know, force them to come or say, you know, you have to get checked out or we have to take you to the hospital because there's so much that happens after that. So, you know, the person, the perpetrator stressed, right? What happens to the kids? Most likely they're going to be at the house with the perpetrator or um, down the road, the survivor is going to get a bill, right? They're going to get a bill for the ED. They're going to get a bill for the physician. They're going to get a bill for radiology. All these bills come in when they're seen in the ED. So it really is important that the survivor wants to come to the ED. Of course, if they have, you know, um, injuries that are fatal or really um, that you're concerned about, express that concern with them. But again, it's always their choice. And we can't do anything, you know, magical in the ED. We can't buy them a new house or anything like that. Most of the time they're returning to the situation. And one statistic shows that 90% of the time, the perpetrator of domestic violence has custody or um, has um, visitation alone with their children within 90 days. So that's another thing that we have to think about too, is in 90 days, you know, this perpetrator is gonna have these kids alone too. So the victim typically knows what is best for their family at that time, because they've been through it before. So these are types of things that we really have to think about um, and not force our patients to come to the hospital if they don't have, you know, critical life-threatening injuries um, and they're deciding not to come, it's okay. Human trafficking, we also see survivors of human trafficking. So there's sex trafficking that we hear about a lot, um, which um, a lot of times, you know, these, these, these survivors, we identify them as prostitutes. And then there's also labor trafficking. And along with labor trafficking, one thing that we're seeing a lot of is indebted servitude. So um, we are starting to respond to our labor and delivery units. Um, within our facilities here. And we're seeing women who are brought over from say Mexico or Guatemala who have paid a fee to a trafficker to bring them into the United States to have their baby because they wanna provide a better life for their baby. You know, maybe it's dangerous where they live or the poverty is so great, you know, whatever reason it is. So they come to the United States by themselves. They're pregnant typically at the time and then they live with these traffickers who, after the baby's born, um, they owe money to. And a lot of times they never can get out of that debt, you know, um, because they're accumulating debt too to these traffickers while they're here. So they, they'll owe rent, they'll owe food, they'll owe, you know, care for the baby. Um, a lot of them are abusive to these women. Um, and they're cut off from their families. Um, so, you know, in Guatemala, recently I had a patient from Guatemala. I said, have you talked to your husband? And she hadn't talked to her husband since she'd been in the U.S. for two months because there's no phones where she's from. Um, so this is a really, um, it happens a lot more than we think. Um, so we are trying to get resources for these survivors and the forensic nurse can help with that. Um, we have some outside facilities that will help them um, with these resources and they won't they won't turn them into um, border patrol or um, immigration. So um, that's the biggest fear that they have is that they're going to be separated from their children and sent back to wherever they came from, which could be very, very dangerous for them. Um, so we have some resources that we can um, refer them to. Um, sex trafficking is so easy. So this is a picture of Backpage. It's been shut down, but there still are sites where you can just text and, um, you know, you're usually talking to a trafficker and somebody will, you know, meet up with the person who is reaching out. So with sex trafficking, usually um, there is force fraud or coercion. So they get these survivors addicted to drugs. You know, they take all of their money and then they exploit them. You know, they sell them for drugs. Um, a lot of times drugs are what is, you know, kind of the 
common denominator in all of this, these situations is that they're addicted to drugs. The way to get their drugs is through their trafficker who makes them sell their bodies to earn money. Um, so um, I like to ask, you know, when we do this presentation live, what age do you think um, a lot, most kids start becoming trafficked? And I find this very shocking because they start at a very young age. Traffickers start grooming kids to, um, you know, perform and earn money for them, basically. And um, the age that Catch Court there in Central Ohio um, is reports is 13 years of age is the first time typically that someone who has been groomed for trafficking has their first interaction with a John or perpetrator. So it's very young. Um, kids are very vulnerable, especially when they're on social media. Um, so um, perpetrators know this, so they go after it. You know, you know, their parents may not be paying attention, right? Kids are out of school right now and their parents are working. Um, so they buy them things, you know, they groom them, they show that they're going to take care of them. And then, you know, they may say, just do this one time because we need money. And then um, they get them addicted to drugs or pregnant. And, you know, there's the cycle. The cycle continues. So when you see these survivors or drug addicts or people who, you know, may be prostituting, know that there's a lot of trauma in their past. So who's at risk? We kind of talked about that. Um, massage parlors, you know, are one place that um, a lot of these incidents go on. So if you drive past the massage parlor and they're open at weird times, you know, there's probably something probably strange going on in there. We are part of helping the Human Trafficking Task Force there in Central Ohio um, with uh, medical assessments on survivors if we need to. Um, so um, you guys may be called out to assist during a raid or something like that. And just know again that these survivors have a lot of trauma and they don't trust us because a lot of times they've been treated very badly, you know, because of their lifestyle or the, you know, their coping mechanisms. So. We want to meet them where they are. So one thing I'd like to point out, who is your patient? So we want to know who our patient is. Usually that's pretty easy to figure out, but who's following you? Okay. Um, an incident happened when I was a medic back in years ago, where we went to a gas station for um, a survivor who had an abscess under her arm. And this is long before the opiate epidemic, but um, it, First, and it, she was in the bathroom at the gas station and, you know, she was on drugs. Um, I'm not sure what, I can't remember. But so we picked her up, you know, we were talking to her outside. She didn't want to go to the hospital, but, you know, after about 10 minutes, she agreed to go get checked out. So we go to the hospital and put her in a room and we're talking to the nurse out in the hall and a man walks in and takes her out of the hospital. She never even gets fully checked into the ED. Um, and so, you know, it made me fearful, you know, at that time, like who was watching us and who was following us, who followed our truck? Um, and it was this man, right, who probably was her pimp. And she had other things, you know, that he wanted her to do. So he came in and got her and took her out of the hospital. Um, and that was pretty scary. So always think about who's your patient and who's following you. And then why don't they want to go for treatment? Um, you know, do they not feel safe or, you know, um, are they told they better not go? Um, but there are resources and we can help them with that. The Salvation Army is the biggest um, human trafficking resource that we use. So documentation, this is kind of in general. Language has power in our thinking. So make sure your comments are kind of neutral unbiased um, and impartial. Um, your language creates a version of reality that later a jury may be reading. Um, so you want to make sure that it's very neutral and avoid the use, use of words such as allege or claim. So the patient alleges that she was sexually assaulted. We don't need to use that word. That's a legal term and um, attorneys can use that word. You may hear it on the news a lot. 
Um, but when we're reporting as a healthcare provider, we want to report what the patient is saying. The patient reports that she was sexually assaulted. You can write that, report that, and put it in your paperwork. It's fine because that's what your patient is telling you, just like the patient who tells you they have chest pain. We never write patient alleges to have chest pain or claims that they have chest pain. Um, so we want to keep it consistent. Cite the history that they tell you if they do tell you in a factual way using the patient's words. If you can't use their words, don't chart it. And then language we choose can have profound effects on the outcome of crime and its consequences. The medical hearsay exception, this is why law, uh, law enforcement and prosecution um, love EMS because um, sometimes, you know, there's a couple ways to get um, evidence into court. One is medically and one is investigatively. Um, our um, charting and our documentation falls under the medical hearsay exception, which says basically that patients usually tell us the truth because they want to be treated correctly. So they tell healthcare providers the truth about what happens. And so this documentation is allowed in court. So we already kind of talked about this. And then some of the resources around town, um, Central Ohio are, I talked about um, Helpline, Sarnco, they help with sexual assault survivors, the sexual assault hotline, and then domestic violence shelters, um, turning point and choices, and then the human trafficking hotline. If you suspect that your survivor or your patient has, is being trafficked or has been trafficked, you can report anonymously to this hotline and the human trafficking task force in that county will get the report and um, be aware of the findings, you know, and they may be able to investigate it further. Um, here's our coordinators. If you guys ever need to get a hold of us, our phone number is 740-615-1276. This is answered 24-7. We cannot give medical advice, though, to you guys on cases, um, but we are able to give you resources if you need it. Um, and that is it. I thank you guys for coming. And if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to us via that phone number or um, email.